How many of you are already members of a burn association, or an organization, or uh, just a, a bunch of friends that get together and do burning? Okay. Because that's how you get one started. It's with a computer. And if you don't know computer, you're going to be suffering the hard task of phoning everybody on a regular basis. Get, if you got 15 people in your group, you're going to get 15 different answers, hundreds of excuses. And Well, I wanted to start this talk off exactly where John Weir left off because Einstein said it, and this ain't no joke. He said, those with the privilege to know have the duty to act. So I'm going to tell you enough today to get you started on acting, because then you're going to know. And it's your responsibility to kick your neighbor in the hiney. If you need to burn because you're living in the wildland urban interface, nobody's talked about the wildland urban interface. That's called Bastrop, Texas. You're almost missing it. But one of the, one of the great things that, that uh, PBAT, that's the Prescribed Burn Alliance of Texas, has is a website. We were put together as a project by the NRCS and Texas A&M University's AgriLife uh, uh, Research, and uh, uh, it was called the uh, uh, Research Institute at that time. Now they've, they've got it part of Texas AgriLife. Actually, Texas A&M uh, AgriLife is also known as the Texas Forest Service. The Texas Forest Service is in the business of suppressing wildfires. Yeah, in 2011 when Bastrop dang near burned up, the only part that didn't really burn that was in the way of that wildfire was some acreage that had been prescribed burned the year before. And there's a video program called uh, uh, Out of the Lands or the, uh, the Land and Change uh, that's a part of our website. If you go to PBATEXAS, PBATexas.org, just scroll through there, read some of the stuff. If you want to uh, put a uh, chapter together, uh, plagiarize. That's what it's for. Uh, take our bylaws, take our handbook, take our manual, put it all together because it's there, and put your name on it for your group and send it to the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, they got burned a little bit after uh, some of the publicity about their uh, <clears throat> uh, less than, uh, say, fiduciary responsibilities were being uh, discharged. And uh, John Weir's group over in Oklahoma uh, filed for their 501c3 status. A year after we did, we were in line for 18 months after we formed our group to get our 501c3. We formed his group using our material. Where'd John go? Um, yeah, I want to confirm that. Uh, Oklahoma law and Texas law are all pretty much the same. Uh, the, the laws in the United States are all pretty much the same. They're, they're, we're trying to get to where the uh, person in Oklahoma can understand what the laws and legal rights are in Louisiana. And it was n n no, no, no accident that I used Louisiana because that was the only state in the United States for years, it didn't even use the Uniform Commercial Code because Louisiana was French Napoleonic Code. So, and they were in Texas, I mean, next to Texas, and we're sitting over here. We're British common law and some Spanish law thrown in together. And so is the rest of the United States. So now they're getting everybody together under one nice big legal roof. And the Internal Revenue Service decided to start screwing around with 501c3s. And we dang near didn't get in the opportunity to get a 501c3. It's not necessary now in Texas to be a 501c3, but I think it's a good idea. Everybody ought to be a member of a prescribed burn association that cares enough to do the paperwork to get there because a prescribed burn is not a controlled burn. 
a prescribed burn is just like it says by a prescription. And that prescription is longer than any doctor's pad you're ever going to see. It's about eight or ten pages of detailed information that you've got to know. And you've got to know more than what you put down there because things are going to change the day you walk out to do that burn. And if you screw it up and, and it gets away, uh, well, you could get sued. And that's what the insurance issue is all about. And that's why insurance was prevalent on our mind. I am a board-certified personal injury trial lawyer. I have been since it was first allowed in Texas in 1978. I've been practicing law for now going on 45 years. And it seems like yesterday. I just the uh, closer I get to the end of my life, the quicker it comes off the roll. It's like toilet paper. <laughs> but when you put fire on the ground, that is an awesome responsibility. I, I can't believe that I was taught to do it by a, a guy who was the last... Uh, non-degreed biologist hired to work at Texas Parks and Wildlife and he knew how to do it with a, a map on the land on the dirt and the sand and a, a statement to go down here and we we're going to do this line with a fire with a drip torch and uh, be careful don't run the drip torch up your leg uh, that, that'll set your pants on fire um, try to wear cotton, don't wear clothes that are going to turn into a, a, a human saran wrap melting machine that will uh, cook you while it's also sticking to you. They, you, you can go to uh, Academy. Uh -oh. Can you hear me now? And get a shirt like this for under $25, I think. It's got an F on here. Fire resistant. That's like a watch. They're, they're, they're only resistant. They're, they're not going to keep the water out. If they're waterproof, they're supposed to. So that's a warranty. But if they're water resistant, they're just telling you, eh, you might not want to get in too deep of water. Well, you don't want to get in any deep fire at all, or a little bit of fire. And if you do, you want to make sure you got some leather on up to here and you got some leather on your soles. Rubber doesn't work well in a fire, so if you're going to be burning, wear some leather soles and uh, wear some cotton pants and cover your head, drink plenty of water. It does get hot in Texas, and it is okay to burn during a burn ban. Just because it's hot and dry does not mean you cannot safely burn. The index that the counties use is uh, uh, calculated on one item out of, when you see a burn plan, you'll know there are hundreds of different things to consider in a burn before you do it. It's not just one index that you want to use to decide to, to ban unless you're absolutely afraid of burning. And it, this, this fear of all we've got to fear is fear itself is essentially true. Because it's, it's based on ignorance. And ignorance is okay. We're born that way. But to do something you don't know how to do, now that's just stupid. And there's a difference between being ignorant and stupid. Ignorance okay, stupid's not. You've got to know when you don't know. And if you don't know, you know you don't know. And the more you know you know, my daddy used to tell me, you know you know the less. But you can get educated about fire and you can put fire on the ground safely, but you can't do it alone. Why do you want to form a PBA? You need your neighbors to help, and they want to help. They'll come over like curious geese. They'll just nose around and, well, are you burning? Yeah, we're out here burning today. Well, can I watch? Sure, come on, watch. Uh, here, take this flapper and stand right there, and you watch, and if you see some fire get, you, you no, 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 you don't hit it with a flapper. You, you step on it and, and drag it. That's fire suppression. We had 31,000 wildfires in Texas in 2011. Think about that. That's just mind-boggling. What was going on with Mother Nature? Why was she so mad at us that time of year? 
or that year. But that's, it was the middle of the drought. It was the time when everybody knew that the kindling was ripe, the fuel was there, and there's only three things that it takes to make a fire. Oxygen, ignition, and fuel. You eliminate any one of those three, and she's gone. It is not going to burn, there's, if, especially if there's no fuel. Because ignition and oxygen alone won't carry it. And I heard the other day that there are some men in uh, a university around here somewhere. It may be in Texas. Uh, it, it might be A&M. Uh, they're leading the league and everything else, including some of the football programs today. But they're putting out fire with audio signals, with sound waves, boom boxes. Uh, I think rap music works the best. But they, they, they showed a fire and they showed this sound wave maker being held over and the fire went out. And it, it does something to disrupt the uh, oxygen molecules in the air that are uh, in and around the fire, but they don't know how and they don't know how big it, they don't know if it's going to take a boom box as big as this room to put out a forest fire or not. But forest fires were not suppressed during their active phase. They literally can't be. So to tell anybody that suppression is worth it is to absolutely lie knowing that the truth is the opposite. Because of those 31,000 wildfires cost us $337 million. And our Forest Service had asked for its budget that year of $15 million. This is a 320-something million dollars uh, off. I'd fire somebody that worked for me that was that off, but fire's what we do. We burn it. And we're going to have to find an alternative. And it's going to have to be a combination. The, uh, the, the real truth of what's going on has uh, come out of an article by the U.S. Forest Service. That's why I asked John, does a federal fire burn differently than a state? No, it doesn't. Everybody, everybody knows that. Uh, or ought to. It just would make common sense that a federal fire would not be uh, any different. But Science Magazine published an article in... See if I can find my date here, my lenses. September of this year. How many of you have seen this article? Insight. The feds and the U.S. Forest Service tried to suppress it. And the author refused. His credentials were too important to him. The uh, feds then asked Science Magazine not to print the article, and Science Magazine refused. They knew, and they had the duty to act. Suppression doesn't work. It's, it's a tool. We're not saying we don't need our volunteer fire departments. We need them to know how to start a fire, though, as well as to put one out. We need them to join in PBAT and to protect the public, a coming and a going, not just sound an alarm and try to get everybody out of their property or off of their property when the fire's headed their way. They, they don't have authority to enter onto private land and to set a fire under our law. Yeah, can you imagine showing up at your front gate and saying, we're going to burn you back 30 acres because you're in the wildland urban interface. Well, you'd say, who the hell are you? they say, well, we're here from our, your government, state of Texas, and we're going to burn your land. And you'd say something like, well, over my dead body, and after you've carted me out of here with a few holes in you from my shotgun, you're going to burn my land. You're not going to tell me what to do. It's my land. And you're constitutionally in your rights to protect your land from anybody trying to come on it when you don't want them to. Now, do you want them to? If they could save it, they would. But once the fire is underway, it can't be suppressed. Once those high wind-driven fires get started, 
you are going to burn and what's in the way of that fire is going to go down. Now that's, that's when you need your neighbors to have been to your place the year before and maybe every year. If you're in the, if you're in the wildland urban interface, you're, you're going to need to burn more regularly than somebody that's not. And how do you know when you're in the wildland urban interface? How do you know when there's a hot spot? Well, you can call the Texas Forest Service. They have a computer and a screen that makes that look like my TV set back when we first got a TV set and a 19-inch screen. That thing covers a whole wall. It's got the state of Texas, and the computer-driven information on that screen can predict the potential for a wildfire at any given moment in Texas 24-7, 365 days a year. And they know it. You ever received a call from the Texas Forest Service saying, uh, your land is in the wildland urban interface and there's a wildfire headed in your direction, we suggest you leave? Well, uh, if you haven't, you're, you're lucky. Uh, and I'd rather be, what, uh, lucky than dead. Uh, if you get one of those calls, you better heed it because they know what they're talking about. With that information and you forming a PBA, you can do something about knowing what the problem is and you can act on it. But we've all got to get our act together and get it done. PBAT was put together at PBAT's PBAT, Prescribed Burn Alliance of Texas, in order to give some substance to different groups in different parts of the state that didn't have the same resources to do things with. The, uh, there's 12 to 13, and it's kind of a moving target because one group is, will say one day, we don't think anything's going to go on with value and we're going to cut back or we're going to leave. And we'll say, stay put, we're, we're new, we're in our infancy. It's our first four years in operation and we hadn't even gotten funding yet. But the Texas Department of uh, Agriculture is in charge of the Prescribed Burn Board of Texas. It's in charge of certifying prescribed burn managers. And by the way, I am a prescribed burn manager. I have passed that test and it was tougher than becoming a board certified personal injury trial lawyer. I guarantee you, you had to have an 80 to pass. I made an 81 and figured I overstudied. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough. Now let me, let me hit this. Uh, I don't want it to go to waste. We've got uh, prescribed burn associations uh, virtually all over the state. Uh, we've got 123 counties out of 254 that are, that are covered. And there's no reason for somebody in a county that doesn't have a prescribed burn association office or membership in it to, to be the first person in that one uh, to uh, join and add your county to one that exists. It's, it's an administrative uh, hassle, but it's more fun if you take your county and you form your own Prescribed Burn Alliance or association. And the P Prescribed Burn Alliance of Texas will be there to help you. We will send somebody down and we're all working for the same fee. Uh, this is free. This is 501C nothing. We get absolutely no pay for all this great work and uh, the satisfaction of seeing the growth of this develop nationwide is, is really satisfying. Uh, the prescribed, the, the coalition of prescribed burn council had every state in the southern belt, the, the so-called Bible belt of the United States, all the way from California to the west coast, east coast as members except Texas. And it's just like a big old belt buckle right there in the middle of their, their belt. Big old white spot. Just like the shape of Texas, I wonder why. Well, your PBAT, your Prescribed Burn Alliance of Texas has joined that association. So now they have a, a complete group all the way across. And the reason most of these groups get together is to pro provide a larger marketplace for 
the insurance company so that they can find some justification in moving into an area. And I'll, I'll tell you that the, the Prescribed Burn Alliance of Texas has a philosophy that I, I, I don't know if I can take credit for it. I articulated it and nobody said, no, you're wrong. Everybody just said, yeah, you're right. But I don't think that it is right to ask you or your neighbor to put up your time, put up your sweat equity in furtherance of helping me with my burn. It's certainly not right to ask me to do that, to help you with your burn and to put my equipment because nobody's supplying us with fancy fire trucks to come onto my property and put your life in the line of fire. You could go home a widow or, or a widow. And ooh, thank goodness none of that's happened yet. But that's what we're doing. We're not playing with fire. That'd be, that would be a recipe for death and disaster. This is serious business. And most people don't even know that, that we exist. The volunteer fire department in our community thought we were just a bunch of crackpot fire bugs that like to start brush fires when things were, were bad. One of our members did a study of all of the burns in our county from all the volunteer fire departments that are supposed to report. And they don't all do that. But he, there was not one instance of a prescribed burn getting out of line, getting out of fire, getting out of hand, and causing a, a fire, or a bigger fire, or any other fire. And those are the fires that can be suppressed. That's why we need the volunteer fire departments involved in Texas with us, not just waiting for it to get out of hand and get called on the phone. Uh, the benefits of prescriptive fire are more than just wildfire uh, prevention. Uh, it, it, it's good for the land. It, it's good for the landowner. It's good for the wild animals. I, I've sued many, many a lawyer because that's what I do for a living. As a board certified personal injury trial lawyer, uh, I don't chase ambulances, never have, never will. But I do sue some lawyers who breach their fiduciary duties to their clients on a regular basis because that's what they do when they do something wrong. And a fiduciary is somebody who puts their, their ward or their, their person they're in charge of, like their clients, business, and interests in front of their own. Mothers call that having a child. They make particularly good lawyers for that reason, I might add. They know the importance of something that is more important than their own life. And that's their child. Your land is in that category. If you think you own your land, you're wrong. It's going to own you someday. You're just renting it from your children. So when you have wildlife on your land, look at yourself and your wildlife as a fiduciary to that wildlife. That you owe it a higher duty of care than you owe yourself. And you'll know what you need to do to make it right with the, with the wild animals. They'll, they'll tell you. They'll come out and eat on that uh, black field that's smoking and little tendrils are coming up right after you've burned it. Uh, a, a prescribed burn is a, is a, a mystical sort of experience. It, it, there's, a, there's a spiritual calm right after it's over. But you, you lay down a black line against the uh, backfire so it doesn't rage and spill over and jump your, your fire break. And you let it grow out there 15, 20, 30 feet. Then you do a flanking fire on either side. This is just a square box with wind coming from that way. And when you get down to the end, you see it up there where you just started. Those black lines are coming into the side and forming a big V. You walk across that baseline with a torch. The wind's behind you, and you're moving fast. You better, because you can 
look back and there's big blue black billowing smoke and yellow flames streaking out of it and you get to the end and all of a sudden it's just oh. no nothing it's over and it's, it's quiet there's just little tendrils of smoke coming up off the land and if, you, if you're lucky, you don't have any flaming rabbits. <laughs> they, they'll set your neighbor's land on fire in a minute. Uh, and you don't want any of those. Uh, oddly enough, groundwater is benefited both in quality and quantity by fire. And I, I, I find that to be one of the largest ironies there are because it costs $40,000 a day to rent that airplane, airplane. And it did in uh, 2011 when uh, Bastrop nearly burned up. Uh, it cost $40,000 a day back then for that airplane and $20,000 a dump for each load of water dumped. And ooh, they didn't always hit the target because <laughs> they're flying through smoke themselves and in danger. Now that is a waste of water and a waste of money. That if we put as if we put one million dollars of time and interest into the prescribed burn alliance of Texas, we can outperform the Forest Service in a short period of time. It's not going to take long. It's just that we're not going to know when we didn't get the wildfire we didn't want because we had pre-burned. But you will see a reduction. And sometime when I get a little more time uh, to talk about it, uh, I'll tell you how we can do it for a song and sing it ourselves, as my daddy used to say. Woo, I'd like to sing that song. I can sing off key and still make money. But it's true that incentives work. And we don't have a program where somebody is incentivized to round up his neighbors, get them interested, identify the hot spots, work with the Texas Forest Service to know where to go, and get it done. There, there's no coordination. How would you like to have a bonus paid on the savings off of the uh, Forest Service's suppression fund or the state's $337 million that it lost out of, what, where, where did it come from, the education fund? I, I don't know. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't tell us that. It's none of our business. I mean, it's all our business. And get involved in a PBA and make it your business because now you know it's important. It'll save you life. Thank you. Anybody got any questions? Questions for, oh, there we go. Yes, ma'am. So, um, has there been studies or research that you do? Um, does somebody go back over the years and see what the benefits are or are not for particular, you know, for instance, if you're trying to reduce invasive, that people have gone back and made assessments of has that really helped in this situation? It was in, like invasive plants. What, like invasive grasses? Yeah, well, uh, I have. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's why I started burning, was to try to do something about the invasion of KR blue stem onto my property. You know, that's one of those improved grasses given to us uh, for the purpose of cattle. And uh, I wanted uh, wildlife. And 84% of Texas is open space land use or better put, non-use. And the KR blue stem is everywhere. It's, it's an invasive. I've poisoned, I've burned, I've poisoned and burned. I've burned and poisoned. I've not done anything at all. And the drought damn near killed it all. But the only thing that did work for me was a mowboard plow on a small section of, of acreage 
in the Bermuda Bahia. Which, which one's got that old bloody root on the end of it? Is that the Bahia? That's the Bahia. Bahia. I had some Bahia that, that blew in unwanted too. And that, that old bloody root just laid there in the Texas sun in July and cooked uh, so bad that uh, it didn't come back. Didn't want any more of my moldboard plow. But that's a, uh, uh, if you've got a lot of KR, if you've got several acres of it. The what? Uh, I, I, I don't know, uh, split me from coffee about those. I, I'm a lawyer, you know. I'll tell you if I don't know. Yes. And I don't know when in, in Texas the, the summer ends and the winter begins. Uh, uh, so I, so I, I've, I, I haven't uh, really uh, tried to do anything except burn when it was safe and uh, when there was insurance. And there's only, there's only, unfortunately, and it's landowner based, but House Bill 2112, uh, 2119 this last year allows the transfer of liability from the landowner to the burn association or organization, which I almost forgot to mention is probably the best reason to be a member of one. If your organization has insurance and it does the burn, most of them around here and now are saying, well, we don't actually burn, our members burn. We're just uh, officers, we don't want to get sued. Uh, and PBAT uh, certainly doesn't burn, it just tries to get you insurance and good laws. Well, they gave us 2112, 2119, excuse me, so well, so quickly, my wife says, why does the Texas legislature like burning so much? And I said, what do you mean? She said, it slicked through. I said, yeah. She said, there was, no, there was no, hardly any debate. And I think there's, a, uh, there's something in the chemistry of the makeup of Texans and, and our, our government that will lead us to the right answer, even if it's through the wrong door, most of the time. But they now have in place a vehicle for commercial burners, to a, take on all the liability, and for us freebies, our association takes on all the liability if it has insurance. They are not going to let us off the hook without some financial responsibility. And let me see a show of hands. How many of you would like burning being done by a person who had no sense of financial responsibility? <laughs> I think not, yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think so either, but Paying for it is another matter. Uh, PBAT has recently had a meeting with the uh, new director or commissioner for uh, agriculture in the state of Texas, Sid Miller, and very nice reception from him. We have great expectations, and uh, we uh, hope that uh, there may be some help from the Texas legislature. This project is too big for us to individually fund it. It, we, we can't do it. We're not, our membership is not going to do it. Uh, but we need the membership to grow, and it is. Uh, we're about to add another group in the Piney Woods, and we just added a, a, a group that was out in West Texas that were feeling lonely and unloved and took in 23 new counties out there. So uh, we're, we're getting there, and we need you to participate and to help. Every little bit helps. It doesn't hurt a bit. Thank you.
Well, my, my, my first rule of seminar is if you learn something new, uh, get up and leave because it's uh, time to remember it. Uh, and if you learn two new things, you'll have to get them confused and forget them both. But if you don't remember anything else out of this session today, remember this. Suppression is a fraud. It does not work when it's needed. And it shouldn't be funded. Thank you.